Our sp first speaker this morning is Helen Binns. Um, Dr. Binns is a professor of pediatrics and preventive medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern uh, University, and she directs the lead evaluation and wealth wellness and weight management program at Lurie Children's Hospital Chicago. Helen has been working on this issue for decades and has been a remarkable partner with us. But the other thing I really want to say is that when you talk to families who have ended up going through the lead clinic, um, it's not only helping their child deal with the lead, but it's also helping with the emotional piece to that. And she is extraordinarily responsive to her patients, to advocates, to researchers, and is a researcher herself. So thank you. Great. Thank you. How do I get to my slides here? Just click to access. Um, I'm not sure what to do. Oh, here. Okay, great. This is a really quick overview of a lot of stuff, so hang tight here. Um, so I first wanted just to give you the historical perspective of where we in the medical community are coming from and really the, um, the decrease over time in what we have, when we have started to take action for elevated, for blood lead levels um, really has been dramatic. So even over my medical career, it's come down quite a ways. Um, and here's where we are in where children in the U.S. have been in lead poisoning. In the late 70s, the average lead level of children in the U.S. was 14.9 of children 1.5. So overall, the nation as a whole Almost everybody had an elevated lead, and 88% of U.S. children had a blood lead above 10, 10 or higher. So that is, you know, dramatically more than where we are today. And then they got rid of lead in gasoline for the most part, although it's still in aviation fuel and some race car fuel. Um, and where we are now in the latest National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, um, is that the average lead level of children in the U.S. is 1.3. So, wow, dramatic decreases we have seen here, but 2.6% of children have a lead of 5 or higher. You'll never again see percentages with 10 or higher because there aren't enough children in the NHANES to give you reliable statistics. This is a really important conceptual understanding slide of how lead enters the body and the system. Um, most adults, many adults have gotten their lead through inhalation and that's how we got it when we had exposure to the gasoline. Most children get lead through ingestion but the absorption is very variable depending upon nutritional status and upon um, uh, whether you're fasting or not. When you first get the lead through ingestion, it all ends up in the red blood cell uh, system in the, in the blood. So you get a, a dramatic spike, you can, due to that time period. And then over time, the lead is dispersed into the soft tissues. It has a little bit of excretion, but most of it, or 70% in a child, ends up in the bone where it persists a very long time with a half-life of 20 years. Um, this is the scenario. When you have an acute exposure, your lead goes up, right? short-term acute exposure and then it goes down over the next month or so so you hit a new body equilibrium versus in chronic long-term exposure you have a level that's pretty consistent for a very long time period when you get a blood lead measurement it's kind of hard to know how to interpret it because there can be inherent air built into how the laboratories are working um, the legally allowed air limit for, for a test is plus or minus four. So if you get a laboratory value back that says the lead is five, you know it's between one and nine, reliably. Um, most labs can get within plus or minus two, but still a level of four is three to six. It's still kind of a wide window. So I think what's important is that you really look at LEDs over time. And then for each laboratory, the limit of detection varies. And now a lot of 
laboratories, there are a lot of medical offices that we know of are using tabletop analysis methods where the, air, uh, the limit of detection is about 3.3. So, you know, there is a wide window. When you get a laboratory back, you got to sort of look at it with a lot of precautions in mind. There is a bias for finger stick lead. It's really hard to do a venipuncture on a one-year-old. You can do a vena, your finger stick, but on the whole, the bias is ele more elevated, a plus one. So there is a lot of issues just related to the blood interpretation itself. Um, and when, this is a very old slide from EPA, but um, I, I look at it in, uh, because it really helps me understand how long these leads are going to be high. So if at time zero you have a blood lead, let's say, that is 30, and that's the average lead for this child, it's in the equilibrium state, if I can get rid of the blue line here, 100% of lead in that child's environment, the lead level will finally be to 15 one year later, right? So, wow, lead just really sticks around. It has very slow excretion. Once you're high and you're in a steady state, it's going to be high for a while. Whoops. Um, three slides just to show you also where we're coming. These present data over about a 10-year period uh, between about 2000 and 2010 to show you the national statistics in that we are making progress. So the purple line here is the pre-50 housing, which is the highest risk housing, and we have come down. The national level here, blood level, is 1.3, which is the red line is the average, and we've, we're making headway even in children who live in the oldest housing. We're making headway by race ethnicity groups. The, uh, the split here is one between black and white uh, children in the NHANES data, and now we're down to a split of 0.5. So we are making headway in the disparities related to lead. We're also making headway in among children who are um, uh, low income. So the purple, the split was 0.8, and now it's 0.4. So, uh, so we we're, we're, are addressing some of the disparity that has been there. Um, this next few slides are really to help you understand how much lead uh, and how lead impacts a child's IQ and cognitive development. So this is a study where they took data from seven longitudinal studies and each of those studies alone did not have enough children who actually had a blood lead under 10 to say anything about blood leads under 10. So they did, in the pooled analysis, they had uh, 1,300 children, and they created this slope here. So the slope is the decrease in IQ for a concurrent blood lead level. And what that means is the blood lead level drawn at the time of the IQ testing. And you can't really do IQ testing in a child until they're at least five. So they looked at past leads and average leads, at peak leads, all of those. They are not as predictive as the blood lead at the time of the IQ testing. So the focus is not here in what's really these isolated events in the past. It's where you are now here at age five to seven when these kids were tested. So, uh, but, but interestingly, and sort of reconfirming what other studies had shown at this time, for an increase in, in this concurrent blood lead level from 2.4 to 10, right, you get a drop in IQ of about four points. When you go from 10 to 20, the curve sort of narrows down. You get a drop of about two points, and 20 to 30, you get a drop of one more point. Now, this study was able to adjust for a number of things, including the home score. This is a test of the social and the resources within the home to support the nurturing environment of the home. Uh, it added birth weight, maternal IQ, and maternal education, which are very strong predictors of how the children are going to do in their early preschool years. Here's a study from Mexico. This is uh, 
uh, looked at IQ when children were eight to ten, six to ten years of age, and with blood lead concentration of the mother at 28 weeks gestation. And this also has the same sort of curve with a steeper slope in the early blood lead uh, periods and more, near, more flattening as you go out. Um, uh, what two things I wanted to point out is really that when you look at this, you think for any individual child, this is Gatterpont is all over the place. A single blood lead cannot predict what that child's IQ is. There are too many other factors going on. Um, and this uh, curve also was able to adjust for maternal IQ, sex, birth weight, socioeconomic status, and blood lead levels at all other ages, which were not significant factors in the model. The, the model really focused on blood lead at 28 weeks gestation and the child blood leads during the child's life weren't as a factor. Um, we we uh, have a little more information on this from Ann Evans' study. I don't think she's here today. Um, but thanks, Ann, for this long-term study she did. Her aim was to really look at the dose response of blood lead levels to the Illinois Standard Achievement Test failure here in Chicago. So she took Chicago children, born 20 years ago, right, 94 to 98, who had blood leads in 96 to 2006, and who had the Illinois State um, uh, Standard Achievement Test between 2003 and 2006. So we're, we're looking a little bit in the past now. She was able to match the children between the ISAT scores, the, the lead database, and she picked the lead at their oldest age in the database, and the mean age was almost four years old. So we're talking the later leads, which as I showed you on the other tests, you know, the concurrent lead at age five to seven is probably the best predictor. So good, Anne, I'm glad you picked that one. Um, and she matched it with birth certificates to get a little bit of information about the mother's educational status. And there were 50,000 children total, and of those 47,000 had a peak lead at that age of less than 10. So what she found was that the reading failure uh, for every five micrograms per deciliter increase in blood lead at age about four, right? there was an overall 1.32 increased rate of failure for the reading test. And interestingly, the failure rate for the white sample in this population was higher than for the black or Hispanic population. In the black and Hispanic population, these numbers were statistically significant. So wow, interesting, why would that be? Um, so overall, 13 to 14 percent of failure was due to the blood lead level uh, having a level of 5.9 versus 0.4 at age four years. They were able to control for a number of things, including maternal education, participation in the lunch program as a sign of poverty, and the child's birth weight, but they were not able to control for maternal IQ the nurturing environment of the home environment score and that the blood lead was done at a bazillion different laboratories with different uh, standards and cut rates. So to me, I think, okay, yes, this is another study that shows us that lead is important. There are a number of other factors that we have to weigh in here um, and we need, we need to understand that when we interpret this. So this is just from a study that's quite old now, but it was out of Porphyry, Australia. And I presented just to show you what people can control for when they're trying to tease out the effects of lead. Um, and that includes mother's IQ is very important. The home environment score is very important related to feeding and education and parents in the home. So all of these things are very important. Um, this study, is pretty recent, but I present it to you because it gives me and gives parents hope. Are the, they were trying to determine are the negative effects of lead affected by the quality of the home environment measured by the maternal support for homework and extracurricular activities. 
And this was a sample in Mexico where the average maternal education was sixth grade. And what they concluded was that when the parents are involved and concerned, it can mediate the effects of lead on the child health behavior outcomes for both cognition and behavior. And that the mother's educational level was really much less of a factor than their focus on support for their children. So I think we can really make a difference. Here's what the pictures are of lead. Uh, lead is uh, prominent and it's all over. It's really in our houses all over Chicago, and especially with 67% of pre-1940 homes uh, assessed to be having a um, housing-based lead risk paint factor, but it really is across all housing ages. And children are, pr are particularly exposed at windows and porches and in soil, um, and we are tracking it in here. Uh, there's a bazillion other sources, and um, uh, they're all over the place. Uh, some have been mentioned. Um, a lot of uh, home of imported products and things that people are bringing in from all over the place. So now that it's really sort of a mystery game trying to figure out where a child is exposed, it's not as um, easy as it once was. Um, the next one just goes to, uh, I'm focusing on the child as a setup for absorption of lead. And this is the one thing I think providers and especially need to know is that low iron uh, status can really increase gut absorption of iron and the body thinks lead and iron are the same. 9% of all young children have a low iron status with 2% having iron deficient anemia. And the risk for low iron status is a lot of factors, and we don't fight this aggressively enough, and it makes children be a setup for absorption of lead. Uh, there is a recommendation for providers to look at ferritin in this high risk group, and in the patients I have seen over the last few years, 16% um, of children have a very, very low ferritin, and 30% have a a low ferritin, which I think the ferritin needs to be at least 24 and preferably 50. Most often these children have a normal hemoglobin status, so it, it, providers who are looking at hemoglobin are missing child as a setup for lead absorption. Um, our water limit is 15, and there is a study in, uh, these are pregnant women whose, whose uh, blood leads were 3 and 2.4, these are out of Germany and they lowered their water by having one group use flushed water and one group use bottled water. You can lower your um, lead level a little bit by that means. Um, in a study in Montreal, they were using a uh, five minute flush sample and then they let the water sit for 30 minutes and took repeated samples. The mean water lead was 1.6, which is really, really low, right? The flush sample was a little lower, 0.89. The stagnant water after 30 minutes is 2.2. And the water in the summer when the pipes are hotter versus winter is a little higher, about six uh, higher. So there are different factors that influence water. These children in the sample had a lead of 1.3 and um, their leads are up just a little bit related to um, the water by 1.1 percent. Um, so really, in conclusion, um, our lead levels we know historically have continued to fall. We think lead exposure matters, but we also can help parents fight back. They don't have to think they're doomed. And I think really prevention is multifaceted. It goes from the medical community to the public health community to the uh, construction community. It really has to address all. Okay, thank you.